Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. It is good to see all of you that are here and uh, all of you that are not. I hope I've seen some folks on Facebook Live and uh, we are glad that you're joining us this morning. And I can't believe there are not any first time guests. My goodness. So, but we do have some, uh, you guys are, I mean, you're tired or something. All right. Um, hey, so we do have some really special guests with us. Brian and Tammy Calloway are here from, uh, they're from Africa. So can you guys stand, uh, please? Thank you. Give them some love, guys. Thanks for coming today. And uh, Brian uh, and, and uh, Tammy, you can be seated. They had an opportunity, and actually, uh, Titus is over here. So he's, uh, I don't want to embarrass you, but uh, we're glad to have you with us too. Uh, they, they have uh, been in the, the, uh, the Journey Fellowship this morning sharing, so all the other fellowships should be jealous. And uh, so you guys will have to come back now and hit all the rounds. But uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'm glad that you guys are here. I have a very special um, place in my heart for the Callaways, of course. Brian and is, uh, is in our discipleship DNA. So going from Jesus all the way through me to him. And it's exciting to see what God's doing through uh, Brian and Tammy. So be praying for them. I'm going to have you come up and pray over the offering at the end. So keep that in mind. So I'm glad they're here. They're going to be out in the foyer after church. So you'll want to make sure to, to say hi to them and check out uh, the ministry. And you'll be seeing Brian and uh, Tammy and Titus in, uh, in April, too. They'll be here for our Bible, our vision conference. So I'm looking forward to that. Also, on top of that, we have Bobby Blaine. And you're like sugar on top. So, Bobby, it's good to have you back. And uh, everybody knows Bobby. Give her some love, too. Yeah. <clears throat> sorry, sorry we didn't get the whole crew here, but you'll get to see them in the weeks to come. So we're glad. Uh, what's that? Yeah, you're, you're going to move back. That's right. So if somebody has a place for cheap, get her a place to live cheap. So uh, I'll put a little plug in for Bobby. She is coming back, and uh, we're glad to have you. She's never, In a way, you've never left, so you've always been in her heart. So it's good to have you back. It's good to have everybody here. Uh, this is our vision update. So if you have your Bibles, please be turning to the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter 27. And uh, I appreciate you all being here this morning. If I haven't said it already, Happy New Year to those that are just... You know, getting here for the first time, uh, if you didn't make it last week or what have you through the holidays or, your, uh, or whatever the case may be, we're glad to have you here. Uh, and so what, we, what we're going to do is what I do every year around this time. I usually take a couple weeks and just clear off a spot and talk about vision. And, uh, and so <clears throat> uh, we've had a good few weeks. As in a, in a, few, a couple weeks ago, we celebrated the Lord's Supper, right? And, and God really prepared our heart for the church. We came together. As one man, man Jeff Trude, uh, preached an incredible message on, on, the, on the need to, um, uh, to prepare our heart for the Lord's Supper. And uh, he did a great job as, as we came together for that. And then the following week, last week, Kale Horvath was here, missionary to Hungary. And so God had our heart focused on the world. And, uh, and that's still going on, as even the Callaways are here today. So God really wants this church really to do what we've been doing. If you say, well, Brian, what's the vision? Well, the vision is very simple. It's the same thing that's in our mission statement. We're here to equip the saints of God and the word of God to accomplish the mission of God and the power of God for the glory of God. And so we want to do that uh, every year, every day, every month. That's what we do. And so there's no new vision. There's no new thing that we're going to do. But there are every year we have a different emphasis. Uh, if you were here last year, I know you've slept since then. Um, but we've, uh, <coughs> we had, uh, we had uh, a different emphasis last year. Um, and so uh, it's our 19th uh, year. Actually, we're, that's hard for me to believe we're starting our 19th year. We've completed 18 years here as a church. And a year ago, I preached from Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. And it was, on, it was about the theme of faithful with least and being the faithful with least, faithful with much. And I talked to you guys about how it's so important not to waste time. I challenge you on not wasting time, not wasting relationships, and not wasting opportunities. And so that's where we were last year. And how do you think you did, you know, as you think about that? If you've been here a year, how many of you have been here less than a year? I'm kind of interested. Anybody here on the snowy day that's been here less than a year? All right. Well, thanks for being here. Uh, so you missed that last year, so you just got caught up. And so, uh, but uh, last year, I hope that everybody has making, made the most of the time that we have had, the relationships that we've had, and... Um, and the opportunities that God's provided because they're fleeting and they're very precious. And so we talked about being faithful with least. Uh, if God can't trust us for what's least, he's not going to give us more. And so we've got to take care of what God has given us. And so 
uh, last year the focus was, was really underlying that was, was sowing. And, uh, and I mentioned last year that we were halfway through our, our cycle. Uh, as I have a seven-year cycle, it starts with looking on the field and then purchasing the field. And every year I just kind of work through this process because it's the same process we started to, to actually plant the church. I observed the field, looked on the field, purchased the field, and so on and so forth. Uh, sowed the field, or plowed the field, sowed the field, watered the field, uh, and uh, harvested the field. And then the seventh year is always a year of rest where I do a lot of reflection and I plan for the next seven-year cycle. So right now, uh, in 2020, uh, the underlying theme is watering the field. Uh, as we enter this, uh, really uh, getting ready to enter our fourth, it's hard to believe this too, uh, the, my fourth season um, uh, of growth here at HBF as the pastor. And so this season is going to carry us, this next season, I'm sorry, will carry us into uh, 2030. So when we wrap up the next couple years, as we start this decade, uh, I'll have another seven-year cycle in another couple years. That'll take care of another decade. I'll be 60 years old. And uh, it's just hard to believe that 30 years will go by just like that. I just want to encourage you because time is fleeting. Uh, and what I said last year is every bit is true this year. And today I want to just focus on how important it is to, again, to not just take advantage of opportunities, but God's really, I've been praying really for a long, all year about God, what would you have me to do for 2020? Everybody, you know, is focused on 2020 vision and all those cute things. But the reality is that probably midway through the summer, God made it very clear to me what we really need to be focused on for 2020. And not just 2020, but really until the Lord comes, because I do believe the Lord will come soon. And I believe he has plans uh, for this ministry. I have a plan, just so you know, if the Lord tarries, I plan on working here through the age of 82. But I don't plan on, I don't plan on being the pastor necessarily, uh, at least the senior pastor, through the age of 82. Uh, this next decade, I plan on, we need to make some hay in this church. If, if you look around, our, all of our leaders, uh, I'm one of the younger ones. Jason's the youngest, and he just told me on Friday night he's getting old. And so, hey, brother, you're only as old as you feel. So you're pretty old. No, I'm just kidding you. So anyway, so it comes quick. It comes quick, right? Time is really fleeting and it comes in. This church is about making disciples. And I'm confident that what's going to happen in the next decade is that God's going to continue to raise up. You're seeing it. You just see it here and there. But God is raising up a new generation uh, to, to take over uh, eventually and carry the ball. And, and, and then that generation has to, to train another generation, right? That's what we do. We equip the saints of God and the Word of God to accomplish the mission of God and the power of God for the glory of God. And that doesn't just entail replacing this, the folks here at this church, which is a great leadership group that we have. That's, all, that's very important, but also that we continue to plant churches like we did in Clinton and like we did in KCK. And then I hope we get some down south near Nevada or uh, a butler in that area. I've been praying for that for several years. And, uh, and God only knows where else. There's a church plant going on in Boston. I wouldn't mind if we trained up some people that were fit for that type of church plant and went out and joined Microno in Boston or another church plant or another mission effort somewhere around the world. That's what we're here to do is partner together with like-minded churches as well to continue to advance the kingdom of God. And that's a reality for Heartland. I remember the days uh, when that was just a dream. It was just a, it was just a big vision. Uh, and now it's a reality uh, because God has continued to build his church. And I know the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so this morning, as we think about vision uh, and we think about far reaching vision, I want to challenge you because uh, some of you are like, Brian, I don't look past tomorrow. I mean, I can't get past the playoffs today, man. I don't I mean, I, I get it. Right. Some of us's visions are a little shorter than others. But what I'm talking about right now, I know for some of you are like, man, that's pretty macro, Brian. And that's kind of where I live. I do think in those broad terms quite often. But the reality is, I want to tell you this morning, I'm going to challenge you this morning. What I just talked about, the vision for this church, and I can get into details and building plans and driveways that need to be built, buildings that need to be expanded, buildings that need to be paid off. We'll start with that. All of that. I'll get to some of that next week, okay? But for this week, I want you to know this. Everything I just talked about, if that's your vision, living to be 82 years old and serving the Lord, that's not enough. It's not enough. You got to have more than that. And uh, I'm going to take you to Psalm chapter 27. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab one from the seat rack in front of you and turn to page 799, page 799. Because if I do my job correctly, right, then, then we will continue to, to go forward. If the Lord tarries, and we don't know when the Lord's coming back, 
But as far out as the vision may seem this morning that I already talked about, I want to challenge you with looking past that. Past this year, past this decade, to the catching away of the church, and even beyond that. I want you to think about eternity and what that's going to be like. And we can look into eternity by simply looking into our Bibles. You see, God's vision for our lives in this planet and the universe and even eternity is found right here. It's amazing. Right here in this book. We can look past this decade. We can look past uh, the coming of Christ. We can look past the tribulation. We can look even past the millennium and see what the future holds right here. This is our vision. So if you have your Bibles, let's look at Psalm chapter 27. Psalm chapter 27. I want you to stand with me. And uh, this isn't as, as hectic with less people. So everyone, please stand. And um, if you would, in honor of God's word, let's read the text. Psalm chapter 27, verses 1 through 4. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 27, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will, <clears throat> that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Heavenly Father, we thank you when we praise you for this passage in Psalms. Lord, thank you for David's faith. Thank you for the, David's uh, reality in the midst of his troubles, how he looked to heaven, how he looked to your holy temple, how he wanted to behold uh, the beauty of the Lord. Lord, may this morning as we think about the future, may we think about what it's going to be like to behold the beauty of the Lord, to dwell in your holy place, Lord, to have access uh, to the throne. Lord, there's a lot in the book of Revelation that we could think about and talk about this morning. There's so much uh, to look forward to. I pray, God, that we would start there this morning as we back into our reality today. We just thank you and we praise you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So this morning, I want to just focus on what the theme of the year is going to be. And it's on the board. It's wholeness and holiness. Wholeness and holiness. And, and God's really been convicting me about this for some time because it's so important in this broken world that the people that are whole are found in holiness. Now, you are positionally right with God if you're saved. If you're born again this morning, you're made whole. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. I'll get to that in just a little bit. But we live in a broken world, and, and there's a lot of folks that, that even in the church don't really recognize the fact that they've been, well, they've been saved. Not just for eternity, but in this life. God has the solutions. He has the Word. He has the church. He has the Spirit of God. And, and so we use a lot of tools. We have a lot of tools that we use in ministry to help people. But the tool that we really need to focus on is, is, is God's Word. And, and the attitude that we need to have is found right here in Psalm chapter 27. I'm going to use this as kind of a, uh, kind of a, uh, a springboard to jump off into this subject of wholeness uh, and holiness. And so the first thing that we see here is that David longed for eternity. Do you long for eternity? If you want to really be whole, right? If you want to be able to, to, to you know, not have to be dependent on something else to medicate you. I'm talking about drugs, I'm talking about uh, sex, I'm talking about rock and roll, right? Whatever it is that you got to medicate with. Apple pie, you know, sweets at night, whatever it is that you just got to have to make you feel comfortable, right? There's, you know what, there, at the end of the day, when it's all stripped away, we have everything we need in Christ. He is what makes us whole. He is, well, he's everything we need. He is holy, holy Holy. We'll talk about that as well. In Psalm chapter 27, we see that David had a desire to dwell with Christ in holiness. David had a desire to dwell in holiness. David longed for something that could be only be obtained by faith. Dwelling in the, the house of the Lord, in the temple, all the days of his life. Beholding the beauty of the Lord and inquiring in his temple was not something David could do on earth but in heaven. Why is that? Well, because we know that David did not inherit uh, the ability 
to build the temple. He got everything ready for it, a physical temple, but his son Solomon built the temple. So what's he talking about? I want to be in the temple and I want to, I want to behold the beauty of the Lord. Well, I believe that David was, was thinking about and he understood that in the third heaven was, was, was the temple. Everything that they were doing and, and he was saving for was just a pattern. It was just a, a picture, just a type of, of what was already in heaven. David understood where the praise was really at, and that was in the third heaven. Solomon, not David, would build the temple. And in the meantime, David would offer sacrifice of joy and, and gladness at God's tabernacle as he lifted up his head above his enemies that surrounded him here on earth. Look down at verse, 27, uh, verse 6, I'm sorry, of chapter 27. He says, and now, <clears throat> right, and now... See, in, in verse 4, one thing I desired of the Lord. This is what I want to do, but right now, verse 6, And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies, round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Now, there's a lot in this text. It's also a messianic prophecy. I'm not going to get into all that this morning, but just in a historical context, what was David doing? David was, well, he was worshiping at the tabernacle, right? We know he moved it from Hebron to Jerusalem, and he was a, he was a worshiper of God. He, he was making sure that he was offering sacrifices, and he was glad to do it at the tabernacle. You remember when he bought the threshing floor where they ended up building the temple, right? He was glad. He's like, hey, don't give me this threshing floor. I want to purchase that thing. I want to invest in things that are eternal. I want, to, I want to make sure the Lord knows that I'm all in, that my heart's into this thing. Why? Because, because he had a longing. He had a, he had a yearning for things that were eternal. Do you have a yearning for the eternal this morning? I'm talking to the church of Laodicea. And that's why this is so important, I might add, whether you're in the room or you're listening online. Man, God needs us desperately to have a, have a yearning, like a desire, right? He says in verse 4, One thing have I desired of the Lord. I need to I yearn, and I'm, and I'm praying this in my own study. I'm like, God, give me a yearning for the things that are eternal. Because that's going to make all the difference in our wholeness. I've looked back over the last three decades of my life in Christ, and I have found that I've had tough times every decade. I've had good times every decade. But in the, and through all the ups and all the downs, you know what? I found that the more focused I am on eternity, the more consecrated, the more, more, and I'm not, when I say holy, there's all kinds of definitions. I'll get into that too if we have time this morning. I'm not talking about some man-made standard like the Pharisees had, rules and regulations. I'm talking about a consecration, a focus on the one who is holy. A desire to know him, as Paul said, right? And the, the power of his resurrection, making him the main thing, not just another thing. That's what holiness is about. It's, it's, a, it's setting apart, it's sanctifying, it's, it's, it's a, a reverence for what is truly pure and holy, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, which is God the Father, God the Son and Holy Ghost. That's what David's talking about. I, I, he longed for that. He desired he desired that. I, I hope that we desire that. Do you desire that this morning? I hope you do. Beloved, that, that's what we, we, we did a few minutes ago, isn't it? We sang. I liked it. I mean, I really appreciated Steve's admonition. He's like, hey guys, we are here to praise the Lord this morning, right? It doesn't matter if there's many or few. We're here to praise God. I love that admonition. I was like, yes. Didn't that, I know with some of you that kind of struck a chord, didn't it? It's like, yes. Why? Because because we want to be holy like He's holy. Right now in the third heaven, there are seraphim singing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Right? And we want to get in on that because we know the source of everything resides there. All power, all love, everything that there is, Almighty God possesses. And there is a place in which He resides. And of course, He resides in this tabernacle as well. The tabernacle of your body. But someday you will see him face to face. But of a truth, he's in us right now. In Romans chapter 12, you know the verse. And if you missed it, you need to go back and go to the Living Faith Fellowship, lffellowship.org. Listen to Brian Clark's message, first message on Romans chapter 12. It's a good one. Romans 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. And then it says, holy. I mean, we don't talk about that a lot today. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your 
you know, over and above service. No, it's just your reasonable service. And be, be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I think most of us probably have that verse memorized. But it's not just about memorization, is it? It's good to go back and revisit that. I like what Brian Clark said about that. He's like, God, or God spent, used Paul to write 11 chapters about what God did for us. And then he gets to chapter 12 and says, okay, now this is what I need you to do for me. That was a really powerful point. David wanted to behold the beauty of God's holiness. The beauty of God's holiness. Well, Psalm chapter 29 and verse 2, the Bible says, Give unto the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness. When we worship the Lord, we're to worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness. His holiness is beautiful. You know, I, I don't know what you think about holiness, but holiness is a bad rap on earth. You think of goody two-shoes, you think of people who, uh, like you think of all kinds of things other than what holiness truly is. Holiness is beautiful. I'm going to show you why a little further here in just a moment, so hang with me. In Psalm chapter 50, the Bible says in verse 1, The mighty God, even the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun and to the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the, the perfection of beauty, God has shined. You know, there's going to be a day when God's going to roll back the covering, that, that crystal sea, after the, in eternity future, and His glory is going to flood the universe. I mean, it's going to be beautiful. Right now, if you think about it, the universe is in darkness right now. <laughs> Even though there's these incredible masses of light shining, isn't it weird how it's still dark out when you look into the cosmos? Think what it's going to be like someday when God's glory is revealed and boom! The universe is going to be illuminated, man. It's going to be beautiful. Man, it's going to be cool. I bet it's going to be like a disco ball. Everything's going to be shining and going around. It's going to be, it's going to be wild. Psalm 96, 6, honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. So when David says, I want to behold the beauty of the Lord, I know what he's thinking. He's saying, I want to get to that sanctuary. I want to get to that place far above all my troubles, far above all my enemies, far above all the things I got to deal with in this kingdom. And I want to just be with the beauty of God. I want to, I want to be in this sanctuary. Psalm 16, uh, 96, 9, oh, worship the Lord in his beauty of, of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. As I mentioned, David was surrounded by trouble all around him in time, in the time in which he lived. He, he had a very troublesome life when you look at it. And it really didn't end all that well, even though he was a man after God's own heart, even though we kind of glorify his life. And I look to his life. It's very encouraging in so many ways, only because of his faith, only because of his heart. He had a lot of really negative things going on in his world. But you know what? He understood. He understood what was coming. He had really long vision. He was really looking forward. You know why he wanted to do that too? Because God had given him some incredible promises. Beloved, God has given us incredible promises. We should be excited about what's to come. David couldn't enter in the Lord's temple in heaven, but he could find joyful worshiping in the tabernacle on earth. So we should be longing for holy, the holiness of Christ. Now I want you to, to turn. We're going to leave off the Old Testament. I want you to go to Colossians chapter 3. And I, I've skipped a lot of background information about holiness. I wanted to put in this message just because I know time will not permit. I'm going to touch on it next week, Lord permitting. But I want to just hit on this subject of Colossians chapter 3 because this is also driving my, my passion to, to, to talk about this subject of being whole in holiness, right? Allowing God's sufficiency to be our sufficiency. I'm not minimizing folks that have struggles. Don't under, misunderstand me. We all struggle in our flesh. But we have to make sure that we do not forget where the source of everything is found. Right? And, and so we should, we should long for the holiness of Christ. Now, Colossians chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, look there in verse 1. And, I, and, and uh, if you do have a Bible, please turn there. Don't rely on the screen for this. You need to lay your eyeballs on this. It says in verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, are you risen with Christ this morning? Probably this Sunday morning. But I don't know. Maybe not. Uh, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, 
where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above. Oh, that's like David. Not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Wow. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall he also, shall, I'm sorry, ye also appear with him in glory. Now, beloved, you know, you're, well, you're educated in the Word of God, that we will be caught up together with Him in the air. We understand what, what Paul's a talking about here. It's very important for us to have that in the forefront of our mind because that day is imminent. We don't know the day or the hour. We just know it is the time and it is the season for Christ to come and catch us away. We're not tied to any schedule. We're not tied to the feast schedule in the fall. Uh, none of that. We, God can come right now and the trump of the Lord will sound. And boom, we're out of here. We're changed in an instant. In the twinkling of an eye, right? Like Enoch, we walk with God and are not, for God takes us, right? And he'll just pluck us up out of here before his wrath. But just in case your GPS on your phone isn't working, right? Let's just make sure we know where it is that Christ sitteth. He sitteth on the right hand of God, right? Why? Because he's resurrected, because he ascended. And that is what David was seeking. The beauty of the Lord, Jehovah, the self-existing one, Jesus Christ. He wants to see that beauty. He wanted, to, he wanted to seek that thing that Paul tells us to seek. He says, if you are risen with Christ, right? If, if your life is hid in Christ, as he says a few verses later, if everything about you is covered in Christ, well then, come on, man. Seek those things that are above. Now, you would think that would be perfunctory, wouldn't you? But I've seen in my own life, I've seen in my own 30 years that it's easy just to gradually get away from that, that, that consecrated, that, that focused mindset where you're just completely enamored, where you're completely captivated with the things above. And beloved, I am your pastor, so I do not want to let that happen to myself or you. That's why I'm preaching about this. Because I think if there's one thing that we need to be focused on before Jesus comes... Is Jesus. You say, yeah, but what about the lost people? Well, let me tell you this. You're no good to the lost people if you're not focused on Jesus. I used to, there used to be a preacher one time, he'd always say, you're, there's people so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. And I, I used to buy into that because I like to be relevant, man. I like to meet people where they're at. This church is all about meeting people where they are. You guys know that. We're not going to go back on that. We're not going to get legalistic. We're not going to put on some false uh, concept of holiness. That's not what we're here to do. We are still here to meet people where they're at. I'll talk about that here in a minute. But the reality is this. You ain't going to shine your light unless Christ is shining through you. If you're not focused on, on God, there's no such thing as being so heavenly minded you're no earthly good. The problem today now, maybe in the 1800s, some of these dudes were up in an ivory tower somewhere, you know, like a monk meditating on Jesus, praying that God's going to do something in his sovereignty and wouldn't get out, of the, get out of the ivory tower to go reach the world. You know, William Carey was actually up against people like that. Uh, and there are still people that are caught up like that. You know, they're so afraid of, of um, you know, whatever their theology says, they won't get out and actually do what God tells them to do by faith. Okay, that's the minority. I'd say the vast majority of Christians today are being so entertained and enamored by their sect, their Christian entertainment even, that, th that we often can miss Jesus and miss what God has really saved us to, to be about. We, we know where to find Him, but let me tell you something, beloved. The church really ought to see is having a hard time making that connection. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, you're familiar with it. I'm not going to read the whole passage because I think most of you are familiar with the whole passage of uh, the churches, the seven churches, the last church of the church Laodicea and the epistle or that uh, passage that's written there and the rebuke that's given. But in verse 20, the Lord says to the angel, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. You know, the church of Laodicea, what happened there is, well, she lost heart. She's not cold, no, but she's not hot either. She's compromised. And she's become lukewarm. She has a knowledge, and, and she can tell you where Jesus sits. 
but she doesn't desire his beauty. Her heart's fixed on other treasures. He's already rebuked her for that. And you know what? The Bible tells us because of that, you know, what did she lose, beloved? She lost her, her vision. He says, hey, uh, Church of the Odyssey, you, 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 you can't see anymore. You're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor. Yeah, that too. But the thing that scares me the most is you're blind and you're naked. The admonition of the Lord Jesus is to stop looking and start listening. Listen. Listen. You hear it? He says, I'm knocking. I'm knocking on the door. Would you, would you listen? Quit looking around. You're looking at all the wrong stuff. Would you listen? Would you listen as I knock at the door? It's not coming from the NIV. No, the, that's not where you're hearing the knock. That's not where you're going to hear the truth ring loud and clear, crystal and pure, like holiness in heaven. You're not going to hear it in the NASB. You're not going to hear it in the ESV. Why? Because there's something off. It's just not right. You're looking in the wrong place. The knock is coming from the door, the door of the sheepfold. John chapter 10, it's coming from the Word of God, preserved in your language. It's coming from, it's coming from this Bible, beloved. If you want to know where to go in Laodicea, start listening. Listen, it's even built like a door. Open it up. Listen. God is speaking from His Word. He's always been speaking from His Word. He's always given His Word so He can communicate to His people. He's saying, I want you to listen to me. I'm knocking at the door. Would you open it up and you listen? Now, hey, man, you're in the Amen Choir now. You're like, yeah! woohoo! I got the King James Bible, brother! Well, would you set your affection on things above then? If you were here at our vision conference last year, or, or Bible conference, I get them confused. I'm getting old. Give me some grace. <laughs> you remember, how many of you remember that message Mike Blake gave about the Word of God? It was good. He was taking nothing away from what I was just pointing out. But he was pointing out the desperate need in his heart to get any word, any word, What a shame it would be if there's a world that's desperate for the Word of God. Any word, even a moldy piece of bread, even a dirty cup of water, any word they can get a hold of. While we sit around thinking about how proud we are that we can hear Jesus knock at the door and we won't even listen. God forbid that would be this church. But I'm not just talking to this church. I'm talking to the church. I'm talking about my responsibility too as a pastor to make sure we never forget. Man, never forget where God speaks, how God speaks, and that we go beyond looking and we really listen. David wanted to behold. Man, he knew where to go. Will we set our affection... Will we set our treasure on things above? You know, Jesus told us in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Nothing new to that. We understand that. Where our investment is in this book is going to say a lot about where our treasure is found and what we're going to be clothed in and if we're going to be wretched, if we're going to be miserable, if we're going to be poor, if we're going to be blind, and if we're going to be naked at the judgment seat of Christ. If we're going to cover up in self-righteousness, if we're going to cover up in busyness, if we're going to cover up in facades and then get to the judgment seat of Christ and find out, whoa, he was knocking the whole time and I just wasn't listening. I wasn't investing. So let's just think about it. We got a new decade. We got a new year. Praise God. 2020 is here. So let's do the math for this year. Okay. 12 days have passed. 
It's the twelfth, right? So what's that mean in hours? That's like 288 hours. Uh, if you do, you know, do the math. So have you invested a tithe of your time in this book? Have you given 28 hours to reading and praying and just, just listening at God's you know, just listening. God, what would you have me to, to see here? Beholding the beauty. Not, not just, I mean, just beholding the beauty that God has given you in, in the pure word of God that we're so proud of. 28 hours. How many of us have spent, don't raise your hand, please. 28 hours reading and, and meditating, praying. Well, that's your job, preacher. <laughs> that is my job, by the way, Yes. But it's your job too. God's not going to ask you what your vocation was, what your call in the body was. He's just going to ask you, hey man, did you behold my beauty? Okay, okay, I'm going to give you a break. Okay, I'm going to give you a break because I know you've been sleeping, right? And you sleep eight hours a night because you like a good night's sleep. <clears throat> so, so, you know, that, that kind of cuts it down. You got 191 waking hours. So, so maybe, maybe 19 hours. In 12 days, 19 hours in God's Word in 12 days. How's that, how's that working? Is that a good investment? It's a great investment. Okay, okay, you say, well, Brian, you know, that math's too hard. Let me, okay, we've got to shave this a little more. Sometimes, I, have you ever, done, yeah, I, well, I'm going to say that, but not in this class of HBI students that we have now, but there have been times in the past where I'm like trying to get a grade in. I'm like, oh, I got to shave it a little bit because I just don't want to fail that person. What else can we do here? <clears throat> Let me help you out. Uh, maybe, let's we'll just do 12 days. 12 days have gone by. And, and so 12 hours, an hour a day. Oh, Okay. Twelve minutes a day. You go where you get. You know where I'm coming from, don't you? God doesn't want to hear about our love for the King James Bible. He doesn't want to hear about how many errors are in the critical text. He already knows. He knows what the devil's up to. He doesn't want to hear about how many people bled and died to deliver us our Bible in the English language, though he's got every one of them there with a martyr's crown in glory. He doesn't want to hear all that stuff from Brian, the preacher even. If I'm not willing to just sit and listen to him knock and take my attention off the things that don't matter and make sure they are on the things that do matter. I'm talking about a yearning. You understand what I'm saying? A yearning that says, man, I, I want to know God's holiness. I want to be eclipsed by who God is. I want to allow the Word of God to speak in a way that it just takes all the problems of this life and makes them fade, man. They're just gone away. Well, that's awesome. Open up and invest in the gold, the silver, and the precious stones. And it's all right here, beloved. The Word of God, and of course the souls of men. When we seek and set our affection on things above, we'll have the wherewithal to serve Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Colossians chapter 3, where we are in our text, look down in verse 8. It goes on to say, he says, uh, this is what happens when we, when we set our affections on things above, right? That's what he says in verse or first we seek Him in verse 1. We seek those things which are above in verse 1. Then verse 2, we set our affection on things above, not on the things of the earth. Well, then, then we get down here to verse, I'm going to skip over for time's sake, verse 8. And he says, but now, right now, you, you also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Because we already learned in this text, he's already dead and your life is hid. You're, you're, you're hid in Christ. So verse 10, look what comes. And have put on the new man, 
which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now that's so important, beloved, because we understand what was lost in the garden, don't we? The very image, Christ's image is now in us. Adam lost that when he fell in the garden. Now we have that restored. And he's saying, now put that on. Put on some garments so I don't have to judge you as naked. Put on some clothes so you can be rich. So not with the things of this world, but rich with things that matter in eternity. Things that, that make you like me. Don't you want to be like me? Because I'm your daddy. You see, as, as we keep reading forward in Colossians, you find that, that we're to slip on Christ. We're to put him on. The expressed image of, of God, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3. You go over there and read that. We don't have time. You can mark that in your Bible. Go read Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. You'll find that Jesus, the Son of God, is the expressed image of God. And that image, that image is in you if you're saved. But God says, hey, put it on. To put it on, what do we need to do? We need to put off some things. We have to make a decision of what's important. It, it, I'm not talking about works here. I'm talking about decisions in the heart. These are longings. God, I want to be like you. Would you take away the malice? Would you take away the filthy communication? Would you take away whatever that list is? All those things we saw in Colossians. And, and so I can put on Christ. I, my, my life is so full of dung. That I can't, I can't, I can't, I don't have any more room. So could you empty me of that and, and don't be swept clean so seven more demons can fill it, right? But put on Christ. Man, that's, that's what God wants. That's what we want. That's what makes us beautiful because he's so beautiful. The reason we need to long for eternity is because it's, it's there where we behold the beauty and we will inherit that for all of eternity. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Look at, check it out. Keep going. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy. There it is. Holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. This is what it looks like. You say, how am I doing? Am I really connecting? Well, yes, you are if you're putting on Christ. And, and, and this is what it looks like. Beloved, it's, it's bowels of mercies. It's, it's kindness. It's humbleness of mind. It's meekness. It's long-suffering. It's forbearing one another and forgiving one another. Just like we did a couple weeks ago as we went to the Lord's Supper. Forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Now, I want you to see this. Don't miss it. Beloved, listen. It is no accident that when we start talking about holiness, don't, don't get too caught up. I'm kind of skipping over the, the, I could take a lot of time and just massage each and every one of these attributes. But I want you to get to the last part there because you know what it's ultimately dealing with. Is the thing that everybody in this culture is going to continue to struggle with. It's relationships. Relationships. Beloved, it's no accident that when we talk about holiness, the Holy Spirit brings up the wholeness that's associated with focusing on Christ. We live in a world torn apart by technology. Relationships are not authentic. They're like the iron and clay in Nebuchadnezzar's visions. Right? The ceramics that make the semiconductors, that, that bring a cheap imitation of the Holy Spirit. Daniel chapter 12 is right. He said it would be like this. Knowledge is going to abound, but listen, folks who are, who are listening for the voice of the shepherd as he knocks on the door of the sheepfold are dwindling. If we want right relationships with man, it's just as simple as this. We've got to have a right relationship with God. If we want to long for unity, and boy, the world's all about unity today. Hold hands, sing kumbaya, every, anything goes when the whistle blows. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says, man, if we want to long for unity, we've got to start by looking at eternity. Because the standard for unity is found in the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Holy, holy, holy. Holiness is not an obstacle to unity. As you feel like in your flesh when you're lost and when the devil's condemning you saying, I'm so bad, I can't be right with God. That is a lie from the pit of hell. That's exactly the opposite of what the Bible teaches from Genesis to Revelation. God is holy and he is just and that causes a problem for humanity, not because of his holiness, but because of our depravity, because of our sin. 
So this is the second point, and this is as far as i got to get for today because I'm going to run out of time, but listen to this. you got to realize your identity. Right? you got to long for eternity so you know where to start. But then you got to realize your identity. If you're going to have victory that's transferable to others, we cannot afford to live as victims in the paradigm of pop psychology. Now, I just skipped like a rock over Colossians, and I even missed chapter 2. But Paul set forth some sober warnings to the church of Laodicea there, directly to the church of Laodicea. And he says in verse 8 of chapter 2, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. That's what's going on in Revelation 3. They're focused on something other than Christ. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. Now park it on verse 10. You are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. The authority of the universe, God Almighty, holy, 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 has said, because of Christ, you are complete in Him. Now do you know that? Amen, brother. I believe it. It's in the Word of God. I know, but do we experience it? Yeah, that's different, isn't it? See, Paul is warning of the philosophy and the vain deceit that usurps our minds from the heart of finding sufficiency in Christ. There are several warnings in Colossians 2, and they all attack Christ's identity and the identity that we have as children of God. And this is very important to me because we, being wise as serpents and harmless of doves, have, has, have intentionally capitalized, even on some of the language and, and some of the popular things that are used to describe the bondage and brokenness of our culture. From alcoholism to PTSD to all these terms that we use. I want you to understand, we use those here and they're important because they're the language that the world speaks. But beloved, we don't think for one minute that those terms, those nuances, those things, that, those, those patterns that are established and all the psychology that's often associated with all of that stuff is the solution. And what I really feared, I don't want this church, I don't want anyone in this body going to some, some meeting that, that even we're hosting where we're trying to reach out to people that are lost, people that don't know the Lord, and we're trying to find an avenue to bring them Christ, and you walk away going, man, whew, I am messed up victim. No. Beloved, you are a victor through Christ. In Him, man, is all you need. He is. That's why we have discipleship. When we come to PTSD, our whole goal is to get people back to the Word of God, back to the source of strength, back to where they can understand that, yes, Christ is my sufficiency. We've got to make sure as we do these things that we make sure that we don't fall victim to the philosophies and vain deceits that diagnose the problems but cannot fix them. I tell you, I've, I've, you ever studied any psychology? There's some good things about that. It can actually tell you, gives you some insight sometimes on what is wrong. The only problem is you can't fix it. I mean, the Bible is very lines up with that. What's wrong with humanity? Go back and find the first father, Adam. Not God the Father, but Adam, our great 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 granddaddy. You got problems that ain't just your daddy's fault, and ain't just your grandpa's fault. It goes back to Adam. Okay, we settled that. Now what do we do? Psychology's not going to give you anything. It's going to leave you stranded. But the Bible gives you hope. You can have a new father, a loving father, a holy father that, 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 that will not judge you for your sin because he's already judged his son. And now he wants to invite you into his kingdom. He will judge your sin if you reject his son. And that's the sin that is most dangerous is rejecting the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Realizing our identity, our identity in Christ is the only way to keep our sanity in a demonically induced culture is very important. Our identity in Christ is the only way to understand, really, to have a place, a rock. You remember Psalm chapter 27, what David was doing? He's like, oh, okay, look, I got enemies all around me, right? 
He ends up having a son that turns against him. I mean, he has all kinds of problems. I mean, everything is going haywire in the guy's life. And half of it's because of his own sin. But what does he do? He escapes to the mountain on high, to Mount Zion, the temple, not the tabernacle. He does that too. But he says, God, I, I got to get to a place where I can see your beauty, where I know that it's been going on for centuries and centuries and centuries. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. There's all kinds of power. Let the heaven and the earth know that God is in control. And if he's in control of this, He's in control of my life. First Peter 1, verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Fill your mind with these things. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not as fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Quoting from the Old Testament. We're, we are to reflect the, out, the outward image. I'm sorry, we are to reflect outwardly the image and identity of the one who has taken up residency inwardly. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27, Paul says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yes, Christ is in you. He's, it's a rich mystery that the saints before Acts 2 and, the, and, the, and the prior to the Apostle Paul had no understanding of, but Christ is in us. And that, the Bible says, should impact our conversation, not just what we say, but how we live. Certainly that means our, our verbal conversation, but the, the vernacular of the King James gang means, when it says conversation, it really means how we are actually living. People should know Christ is living in us because, well, His light's reflected through us. And you know, in Psalm chapter 27, verse 1, that's what David said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. David said, if I have any light, it's coming from the Lord. And beloved, man, if you're born again today, I tell you, the light that you possess in your carcass, Christ in you, the hope of glory, is so bright. It's amazing that we can even keep a lid on it. When, when, I, when I was saved... <clears throat> um, Early on in my walk with the Lord, a wicked lady, Amy was with me, so I'm not telling stories here. A wicked lady walked up to my car window, looked in the window, looked at me. It was creepy. He's all get out. And she says, you carry a lot of light. You know what? That's a good thing. She is right. And you carry a lot of light because you know what? If Christ is in you, I mean, he is the light of the world. The Bible made that clear. Satan desires to rob you of your identity and holiness. So don't fall for the preconceived ideas of what holiness is. Some would have you to believe that holiness is a set of rules you need to keep to be close with God, or God will not value you. That's actually not true at all. Romans 5.8 says, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He's not waiting for us to clean up, right? He's just waiting for us to give up. If you're not saved this morning, you just need to quit and give up. He loves you as is. You'll never be righteous enough. He has to impute his righteousness. He makes us holy. That's why that verse says in 1 Peter, be holy as he is holy. We wouldn't have any holiness if he wouldn't have grafted us in through the Spirit of God. We are holy because he's holy. And others would have you to believe that holiness is a state of enlightenment. It's kind of like a Gnostic reality that's obtained by looking deep, 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 deep within. Um, no, I don't even want to, I don't want God to strike me, right? That is actually the predominant uh, perspective of holiness. When you just like get on the web and you look up, holiness is not reserved to Christianity, by the way. It's very popular. Holiness, from the New Age movement to Eastern religion, holiness is part of all of those things, all of the religions of the world. Holiness is part of that. The problem is they're not focused on the one true God. There is no Gnostic reality that's obtained by looking deep within. The only place we need to be looking deep within to find holiness is right here in this book. Don't empty your mind to try to get close to God. Fill your mind with the Word of God and you will draw close to God. That's a lie from the pit of hell. It's a popular one today. 
Romans 7, 18 says, For I know that, is, that in me, that is in my flesh, Paul said, dwelleth no good thing. Don't look, for, don't look for holiness within yourself unless you're looking for Christ. Paul's being very clear here. My flesh, obviously the Spirit of God is, is perfect. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not, he said in Romans 7. Holiness is found in the character and the nature of God. In Leviticus 19.2, the passage is quoted in 1 Peter. The Lord says to Moses, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy. Why? For I, the Lord your God, am holy. You see, what makes us holy <clears throat> is our relationship to God. When you are born again, you are made holy. You are justified, just as if you've never sinned. His righteousness is imputed to you. You say, but that ain't right. No, it isn't. But that's the way it rolls. Why? Because God is holy and he loves us. He gets a bad rap. Holiness, <clears throat> and, and the word holy refer, refers to that which is sacred, that which is sanctified, that which is consecrated or, or revered. Twice in the scripture, in Isaiah 6, 3 and Revelation 4, 8, each member of the Godhead is proclaimed as holy. The seraphims proclaim, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the earth is full of His glory. And so the heart of holiness is so important. Holiness in man is, a, is the issue of heart. In 1 Thessalonians 3.13, the Bible says, To the end He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. Even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, they're under a lot of persecution. You know what he focuses on? He's like, get your hearts established in holiness. Why? Because their world was not very good around them. When your world's falling apart, you know what? Sometimes the only thing that, that makes any sense is God is holy, holy, holy. And now you're holy because he's holy. And no matter what the world, the flesh, and the devil says, he wants to give you a conversation, a lifestyle that makes you victorious when everybody else is a victim. The heart of holiness is revealed in the way God has dealt with mankind from the fall of Adam. You know, his holiness hasn't changed. He is totally perfect. Satan would like you to believe the character of God is such that he is so holy, he wants nothing to do with you. And he is holy, don't misunderstand me. And he can have nothing to do with sin. But while that is all true, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. He cannot be defiled and will not be defiled by sin. And our sin separates us from God. So all that is absolutely true and it is a huge obstacle. But it is in God's holiness that he separates us from God. <clears throat> it's, 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 I'm sorry, but it's not God's holiness. I need to restate that. It's not God's holiness that separates us from God. It's man's sin. It is sinful humanity that has hindered man's access to God's holiness. But God is loving. God has always desired the fellowship with man. The, the fellowship with man. Before the fall, he walked daily with Adam in the cool of the day. Why? Well, because Adam was holy. Well, yeah, he was. He was set apart. He was perfect. There was no sin in him at that time. But God created man as a rich trichotomy, a body, a soul, and a spirit. Why? So he could have perfect communion with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But after the fall, what did God do? Well, he's holy. He just kicked humanity to the curb. He just brought fire from heaven and devoured everything and said, you know what, I'm done with that. I'm going to start over. Could he have done that? Absolutely. He can do whatever he wants. He's God. And he's just, and he's right if he does it. But that's not what he did. Even though he was still holy, 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 he said, you know what, I'm going to start calling for Adam. Say, hey, Adam, where are you? Who went after the sinner? The holy man. Who went after the sinner? A holy God. Where was the sinner? Hiding from God's holiness. We've got a false conception of what holiness is. Something was going on in God's heart. When man didn't want to be around God, when man didn't want to seek the beauty of Jesus' face, when man no longer wanted to see God, God says, I want to see man. I want to see Adam. Adam, where are you? And he knew where Adam was at the whole time. He was calling for Adam. Why? Because God's the one who values our reconciliation. Don't kid yourself. Though he is holy, 
Holy, holy. We see him sacrificing innocent animals to cover Adam's sin and foreshadowing his own sacrifice on the cross. Why? Because he's holy. And though he is holy, Noah finds grace in the eyes of the Lord and builds an ark by faith and escapes the wrath of God on a sinful world. And though he is holy, God mercifully confounded the languages and separated the nations of the whole world so he could delay further judgment. Because he is holy, he called Abraham out of Ur the Chaldees and promised his seed that he should be as the sand of the sea and the stars of heaven. Because he is holy, he called Jacob Israel and promised to make a great nation of his seed. And because he is holy, he delivered Israel from Egypt and gave the law to Moses and, and then to the nation of Israel. And though he is holy, he invaded this earth. We just celebrated last month and his incarnation as a child born to a virgin named Mary of the seed of David because he's so holy because he loves this world because the father said I love them even though they're sinful though he is holy and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross because he's holy wait stop now we've made the whole trip. This passage is the vision of our very church. Philippians 2 verse 9. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that the name of Jesus every knee should bow the things in heaven and the things in earth and the things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, beloved, you find yourself at Heartland Baptist Fellowship in 2020 right smack in the middle of our vision verse. Why? Because God is holy. And because God came to this earth in a quest to redeem man, even though he is holy, he became sin for us. Beloved, people that are holy have a desire to see reconciliation. People that are holy have an understanding that God wants to connect eternity with this humanity and, and restore that lost image. Why? Because if not, his judgment will fall. And it is severe. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now, 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 before the coming of Christ, much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So get carnal and get distracted and stay out of the word of God and don't seek my face. Don't worry about my holiness. Don't worry about what I'm all about. Do what you want to do because it's your right. No, that's not what the text says. It says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. It's just like Colossians, just like Ephesians, just like Corinthians. Why? It's the same holy, holy ghost that lives in us. That ye be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Oh God, this world's going to hell in a handbasket. God says, great, focus on my beauty. Focus on my beauty. Worship in the tabernacle. Beloved, you know that this body is the tabernacle. You know this is the place where the worship's happening until you get to that place. You got, like David, man, we got a pattern in Psalm 27. He says, come on now. Make sure that you're doing what's right. Why? Because I want you to shine as lights, as lights, as lights in the world, beloved. Holding forth the word of life. Not an uncertain sound, but a very clear sound. A knocking to those even in the church that can't find their way. A clear word of God, a clear, crystal clear word coming out of heaven like precious water, man, from Mount Hermon, man. It's just coming down and it's pure and it's straight and it's clean and it's holy. It's a redeeming value that you can't get anywhere else. Holding forth the word of life that I may, that I may. That what he wants is to rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. You know what Paul is he's yelling out through this 2,000 years of history, and he's saying, Brian, do it right, son. Do it right, because when you get to heaven, I don't want to have run in vain. You see, the next disciple, and the next disciple, and the next disciple, and the next disciple has everything to do with God's holiness and what God is wanting us to do. He wants us to finish this race strong. He wants us to stay focused on things above. And he doesn't want us to get distracted. David knew the Lord was, was his light. And he knew that was his salvation. But do we? 
As a matter of fact, your light's so important that if you're disobedient, if I'm disobedient, as Paul will say to Agrippa, we'll get to that in a few weeks, to the heavenly vision. Man, our gospel will be hid. It'll be hid to them that are lost, 2 Corinthians 4 says. In whom the God of this world, you have an adversary, just as Adam did, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. That very image that's in you, that's in me. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Who cares about our church name? Who cares about building HBF? Let's build the body of Christ. Let's build saints. Let's build disciples. God will sort all that other stuff out. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts. Beloved, you're shining today. You're, you're illuminated. Now, I'm not beating you guys up. Do you feel like you're getting beat up? Yeah, I'm sorry. That's not my goal. I'm preaching this to me. I take this stuff so serious. Because I am going to give an account. And I just, guys, I just want you guys to, I want us all to get there, man. I don't want to drop the ball. You know, like Eisenhower, before he stormed Normandy, he wrote a letter. He wrote a letter of defeat and he wrote a letter of victory. He wasn't sure what's going to happen. And I'll be frank with you, beloved. I can't tell you what's going to happen. But I know this is what I want to do. I want to focus on things above. I want to seek and I want to set my affections there. I want to see Christ's light shine brighter than ever before in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, regardless of what's going on, regardless of the isms that go on. Man, may we be victorious when others are being victims. You see, Adam dropped the ball because he didn't believe that God was, hold he believed that God was holding out on him. He believed what the devil said. How many people do you know, maybe even your own heart, when you think of the word holiness, you're like, oh, handcuffs, no fun. You know why you think that? Because you love your flesh. He believed that there was some knowledge of good and evil that would somehow give him something more than God's holy and perfect plan for his life. There's some that won't receive Christ, maybe even this morning, because they believe that lie. I remember many years ago, I sat there in a YMCA 30 years ago with this kid trying to lead him to Christ. He's convicted about his sin, but he's like, well, I, I can't get saved because I want to do something tomorrow. And I just begged him to trust God for today. God will take care of tomorrow, man. Just take care of this right now. But he wouldn't do it. You know, some of us who profess Christ have decided to plug back into the world. It's like the matrix, man. I got to go back. The world, the flesh, and the devil have called. And you bought a bill of goods about who Jesus is and what the kingdom of God's all about. But you know the good news is, is you're still breathing. And God says, repent. Why? Because you can. It's just a decision. You say, but. There ain't no but. You can repent. You can change your heart and you can change your mind and start following God. And God will give you the opportunity to correct your life. You need to buy gold, silver, precious stones and lay aside the wood, the hay, the stubble. And let your reality, your identity be in Christ. And do it now because you don't want to appear naked at the judgment seat of Christ. You see, Jesus' holiness didn't hinder him from redeeming humanity. In fact, it was his sinless nature that made his sacrifice successful. He didn't have to include a sacrifice, but he did. He didn't have to offer mercy to humanity, but he has. And it's the severity of God's holiness that allows us to appreciate the magnitude of his love for us. I mean, His holiness is undisturbed. And yet He has found a way to redeem us, sinners. How did He do that? Well, He took care of it Himself on the cross. Will you be drawn away like Adam? Drawn to the door? The wrong door? Or will you hear Him knocking? 1 Peter 1, 15 says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. So that's part one of my message. Next week I'll come back. It'll be shorter next week after the playoff game's over. And uh, <clears throat> you'll go, well, now's the week to have that short. We'll come back and we're going to talk about fulfilling your ministry. We'll get more practical next week. But for this morning, holiness. Remember these two points. Long for eternity. If you want wholeness and holiness, 
Long for eternity and realize your identity. Because this is the big question. This is la grande pregunta. Did I say that right? La grande pregunta. Yes, the big question. Do you want what David wanted? You can settle. I could have just started and ended 30 seconds and it would have been over. This is the reality. Do you want what David wanted? Or do you want what Adam wanted? As you walk out of here today and you consider how your future looks the next day, the next week, the next decade, until Jesus comes, do you want what David wanted? Do you long? Do you yearn? Do you want to see the holiness of God? Do you want to see the beauty of God? Do you long for things that are above? Or would you rather find some knowledge, some other thing that keeps you away from the holiness of God? And it will be there in that tension where you will already know the answer to how things are going to play out at the judgment seat of Christ. Do you want to draw near and see the beauty and worship his, in his temple? Or do you want to run with the devil and seek something, anything, other than God's holiness? Now that discussion is not something you need to have with me. That's something that we all have to have in our own heart. And it will tell us everything that we need to know about what we've heard this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time.